There we go. A couple weeks ago, I got to take my kids to what was known as the happiest place on earth. Any guesses? We took our kids to Disneyland and McDonald's, exactly. There it is. <laughs> Big Mac. I cannot believe that Mark said Big Mac was his favorite burger. Anyways, uh, we went to Disneyland. So my brother came in from China. Uh, he's a missionary out there. My parents surprised us uh, along with my wife on how, uh, taking me out for my birthday. So we went to Disneyland. It was really my first experience for my younger two kids. We have four children. Uh, and as we were there, my little father's heart was delighted that as we walked in and they saw all the sights, the sounds, the smells, they were drawn to Frontierland and wanted to engage with the shooting exposition. Anybody know what I'm talking about? There's a picture of the shooting exposition. It's probably the least exciting attraction at Disneyland. Well, when I was six years old, that was all I wanted to do. I wanted to stand in front of that little light board and shoot owls and crows and old tombstones. Like, that was what I was hoping to do when I was six. And we'd walk by and say, can we do the shooting expo today? Like, no, we don't have time to do the shooting expo today. And I remember that day when I had some change in my pocket. And my, my mother and my grandmother went off to some other exhibit, and I was there with my dad and my uncle, and I said, I'm going to go do the shooting exposition. I put my quarters in, and I hit every target that day. It was the people around me hitting the targets, actually, but in my little six-year-old mind, I was an expert marksman that day. And I'm hitting these targets, and they're going up, and lights are shooting everywhere. And I run out of money, and I turn to my dad and say, Dad, look at all this amazing score I got. And as I turned around... My uncle and my dad were nowhere to be found. And like any six-year-old boy would do, I cried like a baby. And I was there, and I screamed, and I'm looking for people, but I remembered the stranger danger rules, so I'm trying to find someone in Disney gear that's not a creeper, you know, trying to find someone that can help me. I find this, uh, this attendant there, this cast member. I say, I can't find my dad. I can't find my uncle. They're like, don't worry. We'll find your family for you. And we're walking around. I see my uncle and my dad sitting against the fence. And again, they didn't have cell phones that day, so I have no idea what they were doing. They were just sitting against the fence. And I'm walking towards them, and they both look at each other like, you were supposed to have them, and you were supposed to have them. So as I'm there, and I'm crying, my, my dad comes. He says, are you okay? And like any good dad, he bends down and looks me in the eyes and says, hey, son, whatever you do, don't tell your mother. <laughs> it wasn't until a few weeks later that I would wake up in the middle of the night with this nightmare of being left alone at Disneyland. In which my mother would say, don't worry, we never left you alone at Disneyland. Until my dad overheard, well, that's not the whole story, <laughs> Debbie, to be a matter of fact. But it's wild how the happiest place on earth can become the loneliest and unhappiest place in just a minute. See, there are these moments of fleeting happiness that we all experience where there's a euphoric joy or this great experience. And one little small thing can instantly tip it against our favor. As you see, happiness has been threaded throughout our culture from the very beginning. The Declaration of Independence says this, that we have these unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of Happiness. Happiness is defined as this con feeling of contentment and pleasure. But there's a problem with America today. We are the least happy we've ever been in our nation's history. 2013, this Harris poll was done that only 30% of Americans would say that they're actually happy. That there's actually some semblance of happiness in their life. So when you walk into a grocery store or at your school or at your workplace, two out of three people are living lives that they would perceive as being un happy lives. As we look at culture today with celebrity suicides that are happening more and more every year, these are people that we idolize in culture that have everything that we would desire. Just even recently, uh, you know, I love to cook, but Anthony Bourdain took his life. This is the man that's probably the most, one of the most traveled men in the world that's experienced every culture, every pleasure, everything you would want to experience, but yet was left wanting. Mother Teresa said it so well, she said, you in the West have millions of people who suffer such terrible loneliness and emptiness. They feel unloved and unwanted. These people are not hungry in the physical sense, but they are in another way. They know they need something more than money, yet they do not know what that is. And we're stuck in this place where culture tells us and marketing tells us and media tells us that more stuff will satisfy so this man named Greg Easterbrook, the psychologist, came up with this book called The Progress Paradox. And in this book, he started to study the veins of happiness in American society and started to connect the dots that stuff 
doesn't satisfy our desires and our needs. He said this, nearly every measurable trend except happiness indicates the quality of life in America and Europe has steadily improved for most, almost 50 years. Many, many people suffer from what they call choice anxiety, collapse anxiety, stress, and depression. This obsession with material things makes people overspend, overeat, and overextend their budgets. Their homes are full, but their souls are empty. That's what secular study and secular psychology is talking about, the emptiness of the soul. And this study about our need to fulfill desire goes all the way back to 300 with St. Augustine or St. Augustine, however you want to pronounce it. And he had this, this quote that's really been a study on happiness. This has been an anchor on happiness study, both secular and in Christian worldview. He says, a true saying it is, desire hath no rest. It's infinite in itself, endless, and as one calls it, a perpetual horse mill. As he's studying one day, he looks at a horse mill. And here's what a horse mill would look like back when he was looking at it. And they would see them feed the grain into the horse mill. And here's this horse going round and round and round and round with an endless supply of grain. He says, this is like desire. It never ends and is never satisfied. And as he started to look at this concept that Augustine came up with, they said, you know, we think that happiness is kind of like a treadmill. That happiness is this thing that we need to feed and constantly walk on. They call this the pleasure treadmill or the happiness treadmill. Here's a picture of a treadmill like many of us would experience. What we actually look like on a treadmill. How many are with me at the gym? You feel me. But we have to keep walking on this treadmill, and the moment that we stop, we fall off of it. Happiness is something that needs to constantly be fed with some type of stimulus. Others have said that happiness is like a thermostat you set inside of your house. That You try to set it to a temperature, but how many know people love to mess with the thermostat at your house when they visit? They love to press the buttons, or how many of those OCD AC people, that the moment a door opens up in the back of the house, you're like, shut the door, the AC's on. Are right, anybody there with me? You know what I'm talking about. Those AC people. Happiness like a fickle house temperature, can easily change based off of external circumstances. Happiness is completely based off the external world. And what they're noticing is this. As they study people, that really happiness is not what fulfills a life. Joy is what fulfills a life. But there's a problem. People have difficulty accessing joy because it has to do with the internal state. And secular psychology is stating they believe that joy is a spiritual principle. Joy is actually a spiritual quality that we can't access in a disengaged, unspiritual life. Here's what one psychologist says. Happiness is future-oriented. It is dependent on outside situations, people, or even events to align with your expectations so that the end result is happiness. Happiness is not joy because joy is not external. It can't be bought, and it's not conditional on someone else's behavior. Joy is this unshaken, resolved internal state. But as they're working with clients, they're finding that they can't have them access joy because of the brokenness of our humanity. Here's what another writer writes. He says, my clients lead fairly joyless lives. They find it nearly impossible to open up to the possibility of joy because they are terrified. Not so much of disappointment, but as of experiencing shame. Opening oneself to the possibility of joy also means exposing yourself to potential disappointment and shame. What they're noticing is as they move away from happiness and focus on joy, we have so much brokenness on the inside, we don't have the power in and of ourselves to overcome it. We don't have the power in and of ourselves to actually bring healing, to actually bring wholeness. We have to access a, access a power outside of ourselves that's greater than ourselves to actually experience joy. And I think we have a little secret. His name is Jesus. Jesus is the one that helps us access a true and genuine joy. When you study joy, as I looked in the Old Testament, it was a really unique concept compared to the New Testament. We find that they believed that joy was a quality of God and that in his presence was joy. First Chronicles 16 says this, Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his place. 
So the most dominant times of joy or seasons of joy that the people of Israel experienced was when they faced deliverance or experienced deliverance, which we'll talk about shortly. But mostly, joy was often talked about when the tabernacle of God was present, the Ark of the Covenant was present, and when the Ark was taken, joy was taken. The other times was when the temple was restored, where the temple was built, were the most joyous occasions for the people of Israel. Why? Because God's presence was dwelling there. But what they encountered was this. When they had the temple taken or the tabernacle overcome, the joy of the people was removed from them because God's presence had no place to dwell. God's presence had no home. His home could not be within us because His holiness would kill us. That was the belief. But what we learn in the New Testament is that when Jesus comes on the scene, He talks about joy different than any biblical writer. As He starts to talk about joy, I, I was studying this week, and I saw this subtle little secret that Jesus hinted to in the parable of the talents. You can turn there if you want, just real quick. Matthew 25, verse 21. I really believe is a framework for joy in the New Testament. It says this, His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You've been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Again, one of the most talked about parables we have is when he entrusts them with certain resources and says, Will you invest them well? But what's unique about this is that word, enter. It means to move into a space and enjoy the fruit of an harvest that you've harvested yourself. But you get to enter in and enjoy the fruit of that master. You get to enjoy the fruit of his labor. And we see this in John 15 when Jesus says, make my joy complete. See, Jesus breaks the cycle where joy is circumstantial or seasonal. It's constant. Where joy is no, lo no longer something that we live for, but a place we're called to live from. Because guess what? When Jesus came onto the scene, he made his home within us. The presence of God is among you and within you. And now we have access to a joy that's eternal, not temporal. We have access to a joy that's sustainable. And at any moment, at any time, no matter what the circumstance is around you, joy is available to those that call upon his name. Joy is available by the inworking of the Spirit. So we see Paul write in Galatians chapter 5 that the fruit of the Spirit, when the Spirit of God is inside of you, you have access to love. You have access to joy. You have access to peace. You have access to kindness when there are people that do not deserve kindness around you. Hello. How many are with me? We have access to these things, not conditional on our external world, but based off the internal reality that we have a God that loves us and dwells in us and abides in relationship with us. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at three different elements of joy. As I studied many of them, and there were lots of different angles, I wanted to say, okay, what are three kind of nuanced but practical ways that we can enter into joy? So we're going to look at the Old Testament and how the Old Testament viewed joy, and then the New Testament application of it. All right, we hanging in there? Come on, academics hats are on right now. Here we go. The first way we find joy as we find joy in salvation. Joy is in salvation. Now, this may seem like something we know or we've heard before, but we have to understand that salvation was a significant moment for the people of Israel. We go back to the major salvation that they experienced, which was the Exodus. So when they're leaving Egypt, it says this in Psalm 105, 43. So he brought his people out with joy, his chosen ones with singing. So when they're leaving this place of captivity, they enter into the joy of God and his deliverance. The second season of deliverance they experience is with Babylon as they're held in captivity for 70 years. One of the psalmists write, Then our mouths was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then it was said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. That upon salvation, joy was accessible. The last season that we notice is in the time of Esther with the Persian Empire. And as we're studying this, there was a genocide put against the Israelites where this man named Haman came and said, I want to make a decree. And he tricked the king that Esther was married to and said, I want to have all the Jews put to death. 
So what does Esther do? She fasts and prays and calls the nation to three-day fasting and prayer. And in result, there's a genocide that they're spared from. It says this in Esther chapter 8. For the Jews, there was a light and gladness, joy, and honor. And in every province, in every city, wherever the king's command and edict came, there was gladness and joy among the Jews. Again, we see this theme of joy with overwhelming deliverance. But when we study the Old Testament, we notice that the moment they're saved from a significant event, depression and darkness starts to return. The moment they experience a season of joy, there's always another oppressor. There's always another pursuer. How many can identify with that? It seems like you finally get breakthrough, you finally get movement, and then there's another obstacle coming around you. We notice this in Nehemiah when they start to dedicate the wall and they're celebrating to God. Next thing you know, there's more pursuers around them that are challenging them. And these seasons of joy are temporal. It's not until the New Testament that we start to notice that there's this fulfillment of this prophecy that Isaiah started to talk about. In Isaiah chapter 9, he spoke of a day when darkness would be dispelled by light. That there would be a day when there would be darkness removed from the people of Israel. Light would come and joy would be the result of that deliverance. Jeremiah would echo this. Ezekiel would echo this. And it starts to reach this pinnacle in Isaiah 61. They start to talk about someone that would come, that would be known as the Messiah, that the Spirit of the Lord would be upon him, and he would initiate and inaugurate the year of the Lord's favor. Now, that word, Lord's favor, again, we're not familiar with it because we don't talk about it often. It's not really our culture. But the Lord's favor, the year of the Lord's favor, was referenced as the year of jubilee. Every 50 years in Leviticus, whenever you had a debt outstanding or you were a slave, there was this massive celebration where those that were debtors were forgiven their debts and those that were slaves were set free. It's a massive season of celebration. They would celebrate it every 50 years. But the condition of celebrating the Jubilee meant you had to have control and possession of the land. Well, there wasn't a celebration or year of Jubilee since 600 B.C. There hasn't been a celebration of Jubilee. They've not had sole occupancy of the land that they would call their own. So there's this day of the Lord's favor. So they would anticipate that the Messiah would come and liberate the land from them. Fast forward to Luke chapter 4. Jesus enters the synagogue. What does he do? He opens up the scroll of Isaiah 61. He says, today the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach good news, to set captives free. And to what? Declare the year of the Lord's favor. He enters in and announces the season of Jubilee. He says, this is a Jubilee time. They're thinking to themselves, let's go start a war. Let's go liberate our land. But the liberation that God intends is different than the one we often hope for. And so what does he do? He walks out of the synagogue, and it says the oppressed go free. Those that have been bound are set free. One of the key ways for us to enjoy the joy of God is to remember the day of our salvation. To remember the things that God has set us free from. We call upon that day. In those days when you feel discouraged and you feel down, there's access to joy to remember what God has delivered you from. There's an access of joy, a gift of joy available to anyone that's feeling discouraged. That day you said yes to Jesus is a day you have access to joy. So we can go back, and you're facing difficulty in your life right now. You feel captive. Guess what? There's access to joy to overcome that place of captivity through the strength of God. Because guess what? The joy of the Lord is your strength. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And that joy helps us through the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome those addictions, to overcome those failings, to overcome those seasons of captivity. I believe that a lot of us, we forget that. We remember what David said where, you know, help me remember the joy of my salvation. But there's a joy we're called to access all the time, not just on occasion. That when we wake up, we remember, God, thank you for saving me and rescuing me. And I just want to challenge us. That day of thanking him for that should never get old. It should never get old. As Jesus said, those who have been forgiven much love much. And those moments that you think, man, that salvation thing is okay. We have to really check ourselves and ask, 
Have we really received the grace of God as he's intended us to receive it? Have we really received the forgiveness that God has intended us for, to receive it? And here's the other thing that I think uh, the church tends to miss when the joy of salvation is talked about. Is when we think of the joy of salvation, we always think about our own salvation. But that's only half the joy we have access to. The other half is actually when we start to pray for the salvation and deliverance of others. And see, the church is really good at gathering on a Sunday. We're really bad at being Jesus out there Monday through Friday. See, there's a joy we have access to when you start to see those that are oppressed and bound, friends and relatives, neighbors, come to know the power and love of Jesus. There's a joy we come to experience when they actually get set free. That's what God has called us to live out. How do we see this? Where's the biblical result in this? Luke chapter 10. What does Jesus say? He says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, go out as laborers into the harvest. And what Jesus does that's so unique is they believe that God was the only one that could save and deliver. And then he empowers these disciples to go and do as he did. They now carry this season of jubilee. They now walk in the year of the Lord's favor. And what's so unique is that season of jubilee was not confounded to 365 days. They live it out. It's the, the rest, the labor of God we get to enjoy it. So now they're out there. They're praying for people. They're seeing them delivered. They're seeing them healed. They're seeing them set free. And what does it say in Luke chapter 10? The 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, in your name, even the demons submit to us. That when they actually experience people set free and delivered, there's an access to joy that we have. We see the same thing happen in the book of Acts. Now, it's not just happening with disciples. It's happening with many people out there. For unclean spirits crying with loud shrieks came out of many who were possessed, and many others were paralyzed or lame, were cured in the city. So what? There was great joy in that city. There's joy when we experience deliverance. There's joy when we see God's power set on display. Why do we talk about sharing our love and faith in, with people? Why do we talk about praying for those that are sick? Because honestly, there's a joy that God's called us to access that comes from seeing his power move. There's a joy that we have available to us when we see him moving in the lives of others around us. Just even a couple weeks ago, walking out of our service here. It was 11 a.m. My wife was out of town. I had all four kids, and they're grabbing things and touching things and walking through the, the lobby. Well, as, as we go outside, there's a guy playing his banjo. As he's playing his banjo, we walk by. My dad's like, my son's like, Dad, what's that? I'm like, he's a, he's a banjo guy. He's like, banjo guy plays at church? I'm like, he does today. Here he is. So as we're walking by, the guy says, hey, hey, can you guys help me out? You got any spare change? I said, you know, I have no cash on me. But what, what do you need? How can I help? He's like, well, if I could get something to eat, that would be great. And I'm looking around, and people have left. I said, man, I, I don't have uh, any resources here right now? I said, you know what? I can, I can go get you something to eat. Is there something you want? He's like, ah, I don't know. Is there, is there fast food nearby? And as I'm talking to him, Popeyes pops in my head. I said, you want Popeyes? He's like, oh, it's kind of expensive. I'm like, bro, don't worry about it. I'll get you some chicken at Popeyes. It's no big deal. I said, just let me run up there. I got my card. I'll run up there and run back. So my kids are there like, dad, what are we going to do? I'm like, we're going to go get that guy some food. All right, let's go get him some food, dad. So we go inside the car. As we're driving, I said, okay, guys, here's the deal. When we get back, one of you are going to pray for him. Mm -hmm. Cena and Justice are like, one of us? I'm like, yeah. When are you going to do it? Well, you guys got to pick. One of you will watch the kids in the car. The other one will come with me. We're in the Popeye's line, and we're waiting, and it's, it's no one really in line except for a car in front of us. It's taking a long time. Well, we're there, we're waiting, we're waiting, and I see her open her door, and she's looking down by her door, and she's arguing with the person at the counter, and it's taking a long time. She says, I'm sorry, I can't find my card. And we're, we're some kind of commotion. I said, no big deal. Well, she quickly pulls out and runs over the curb and pulls over and pull up to the counter. I'm like, man, that was crazy. I said, what happened? She said, well, you know, she was, he, she was here, and she didn't have money on her card to pay for it. And she's there trying to order chicken, and she doesn't have the money to order the chicken. We're like, we can't give it to you. I'm like, really? Well, how much was it? It's like 30 bucks, man. I'm like, you can't just spot her this one time. I guarantee she wasn't trying to game you over this chicken. I'm like, no, man, we can't do that. Against the company policy. I said, you know what? You know what's not against company policy? I'll pay for her chicken right now. And they're like, really? I'm like, yeah, it's no big deal, man. She, you could see the stress she was in. It wasn't a big deal. So I'll go tell her, and then you guys bring the chicken out. So I go over and tell her. 
She's like, no, no way. I'm like, hey, it's no problem. I can tell you were frustrated that something's wrong with your card. I get it. I have those issues all the time. Uh, I'll got your chicken. She's like, no, you don't have to do this. I'm like, it's no big deal. It's just chicken. We'll be able to buy it. No one's going to die. So I walk over, get in my car. She comes out, and she is bawling and crying. And these guys are handed the chicken, and she's like, thank you for this chicken. It's the best day of my life. You know, one of these moments, and they're embarrassed because they held this company policy over this woman, and we're there, and my kids are like, wow, this is amazing. And they're watching this, and, and the guys are like, that was, that was a really good thing you did. I said, you know what? You know what would be a really good thing? I'll tell you what. Next time someone doesn't have the money on their card and they're having that much difficulty, just give them the chicken. But if also you can't do that, pay for it out of your own dime. Because guess what? God will bless you in the end. He's like, all right, I'll do that. I'll do that. So we pull out. I'm, I'm kind of angry but happy at the same time, you know. I pull out, and my daughter says, Dad, you heard God. I said, what? She's like, Dad, you heard God. I was like, when? She's like, when you were talking to that man, you said, let's go to Popeye's. God spoke to you to go to Popeye's. I said, that's exactly what he did. <laughs> exactly what I heard. She's like, Dad, you heard that. You helped that woman with that chicken. And we're going to go back and help this guy. So I said, okay, see you rain. You up for it? She's like, let's, let's go. I'm going to go pray for him. So pull in the car. Justice is in charge of the kids. Trust me. I didn't leave him with the keys. It's a terrifying, <laughs> terrifying statement for those who have been in children's ministry. But um, we're, we're there. I walk over and give the guy the chicken. I say, hey, you know, before we go, we're Christians. I'd love to pray for you. Uh, is there anything we could pray for? He's like, no, I'm good. I said, hey, you know, I was just praying for you a second ago. Do you have, a, you have an issue with your left shoulder? He's like, how'd you know that? I was like, I believe God speaks today. He's like, man, it's crazy you say that. I was jumping off the train, and my backpack got caught on the train, and I jacked my shoulder off real bad. I said, how much pain are you in? He's like, I'm, I'm in a lot of pain. Like, Scale of 1 to 10. He said, I, I'm in like a 9. I'm like, really? I said, hey, can, can my daughter pray for you? And she looks at me like... <laughs> And, she, and he's like, uh, yeah, sure. So she puts her hand on his shoulder. In the name of Jesus, pray that heal his shoulder. All the pain would go in, in Jesus', Jesus name, amen. So test your shoulder out. She stands up. He starts stretching. He's looking all weird. He's like, well, how's the pain? He's like, well, the pain's gone. He says, what, is she a healer or something? <laughs> I said, no, we believe in Jesus, and uh, we believe that Jesus heals today. And he, then he says, oh, she channels Jesus? <laughs> I said, we believe in Jesus. And we start to share the gospel with him in that moment. And see, there he walks back to the car. She's like, Dad, this day was awesome. <laughs> you bought this lady chicken. You heard God, and that guy's shoulder got healed. This is the best day. This is the best day. Let's call Mom. Let's call Mom and tell her. I got to see firsthand the joy we get to enter when others get set free and delivered. When others experience healing, when others experience joy, when others experience freedom, we have access to joy. Guess what, church? It's not all about us. It's not all about our self-esteem or our self-concern. There's a joy that we have access to when we help others, when we see others set free. And this is what we see the disciples constantly entering into when they're praying for others is often when joy is present amongst the believers. It's rarely about themselves. It's always about others. Second element of joy, we find joy in song. We find joy in song. The first is salvation. Secondly, we find joy in song. Now, for all of you here, you're like, oh, my goodness. Are we going to sing right now? You know what? I don't know what it is, but the way that God designed us, song is the way we access joy actually verbalizing with our mouth. A lot of us here are like, I make melody in my heart. There's like one verse about making melody in your heart. There's about 150 others about singing with your mouth. And if you are able, God intends us to lift our voice. We find David. It's like the chief writer on this, Psalm 27, 6. Now my head is lifted up above all my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. You see, David viewed song as his sacrifice. He would sing and make sacrifices to God. He was away from the tabernacle. He wasn't able to present sacrifices. He was constantly on the run. And the way he sacrificed to God was through singing to him. Psalm 92, for you, O Lord, have made me glad by the work of your hands. I will sing for joy. But guess what? We don't get off the hook in the New Testament. 
It continues with the disciples. Luke 24, 52. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. When they worshiped Jesus, high probability they sang out loud. High probability they were lifting their voice in song to God. See, Israel understood the power of singing and the power and the joy that they had access to through this song. In Nehemiah, it says they dedicated the walls as they rebuilt the city, and the joy of Jerusalem was heard from far away. See, the church is called to have a sound of joy that the world can recognize. See, I'll be honest with you. Oftentimes, the world is looking at us, and they're like, man, they're more depressed than we are. We have more fun doing the things that maybe their God may not like than this life of religiosity that they live. See, there's a joy we're called to access that's greater than anything the world has to offer. There's a joy in an internal state that's shame-free that we get to live out. And one of the weird ways that God said we can access it is through singing out loud. First Kings, it says, as they were there, they anointed Solomon king, and the presence of God came, and they sang and danced so much the ground shook underneath them. Sometimes you just need to sing and dance before God to shake up that stale and stagnant place we've been living in. A lot of us live in stuck states, and one of the ways we shake out of it is singing to God. Acts 16, Paul and Silas are in prison. They're there, they're beaten. They're beaten for sharing the love of Jesus. And as they're in this dungeon of darkness, shackled up, what's the first thing they do? They start to sing psalms and hymns to God. How many of you, honestly, first thing you're going to do, you're in the cop car. Time to bust out some praise and worship. Time to put on my little music in my heart and sing out loud. It's a 5150 call right there if you start doing that at the back of the cop car. But there's something that they access here that we're called to learn from. This is here for us to learn. So as they're shackled in chains, they start to sing, and the shackles start to shake. And the shackles break off, but here's the story. When they sing and the presence of God comes, others are set free. See, when we sing and worship to the Lord and the presence of God is made manifest in our life and joy is made manifest, it impacts the lives of others around you. See, we have to remember when the temple was there and present and they had this Ark of the Covenant, there's many stories in the Old Testament where the Ark would come out and its power would radiate and there was one man's house that it rested in and they said there was blessing in the house of this man. See, now that we are the temples of God, Now that we carry the presence of the living God, lives of others will be blessed around us. When his presence is activated in our life, there's something unique that takes place. And one of those ways we do it is singing. When we're in those grumpy spots, it's called to sing out loud. Now, you may have one of the worst voices the world has ever heard. But guess what? We have a God that loves your terribly flat voice. We have a God that loves your song. Even this morning, I heard my little son, Kingston, who, who sings in a very monotone voice. Here this morning, we're getting him dressed. You're never going to let, never going to let me down. <laughs> what are you singing, buddy? Singing, you are good, good. He's there singing his little songs. And as a dad, I'm not like, son, you are so off key. No, as a father, I'm like, you keep singing, son. You keep singing. That's our God in heaven. He wants to hear you, and it means you have to shut in the shower and sing to your little heart's content in the morning to wake up out of your funk, and then you sing to your heart's content. You know you sound so much better in the shower. I don't know what that is. The echo and the steam just does it. If you need to lock yourself in the closet and sing to your little heart's content, or your car, and you're that person that's just singing in the car, be that person. No one knows what you're doing. Who cares? They look. You think this is any less exciting? Be that person. Maybe you'll make them smile. But there's something about song. Just a few years ago, it was seven years ago, we were in England, and I'm jet lagged and I'm tired. We just adopted our son, Justice. We're three months into the adoption. And there's one thing you learn about children when you fly overseas is that they don't adjust to the time change. They are up, and they sleep whenever they want. So here's my son. He's up all night sleeping during the day. And I am losing my mind. And one morning, we wake up. I don't wake up. I've been up all morning. And my wife says, hey, we're going to the sheep farm today. Just out of my mouth, I said, I'm not going to no stupid sheep farm. She's like, what do you mean? 
Sienna Rain wants to go and see the sheep, and you can carry justice. I'm like, no, you're taking justice in Sienna Rain. I'm staying home. I'm not going to the sheep farm. She's like, babe, you're having an adult tantrum. I said, you're right, I'm having an adult tantrum. I'm staying home. She's like, but babe, the kids will be disappointed. I'm like, I don't care. I am angry, and I'm not seeing these sheep. Her mother comes in. Hey, we're going to the sheep farm today. I'm like, I'm not going to the sheep farm today. What's wrong with you? I'm tired. Leave me alone. You know, just grumpy and adult tantrums happening. So they leave, and I go upstairs, and I'm irritated. And I'm in my sister-in-law's room, and she um, is de- developmentally disabled. And she's in this room, this tiny little bed, and I'm angry and no access to electronics to tap out with. And I'm there, and there's this little Casio keyboard. So I grab this Casio keyboard. I turn it on. And I'm fiddling with this keyboard, and or organ sounds the best on there, you know. And as I'm playing this organ, irritated, I hear the Lord say, sing me a song. I'm not singing you a song. <laughs> Sing me a song. I'm like, with this thing? Absolutely. And I'm there, I'm like, this is stupid. I asked you to. So I'm there playing this song, and I just start to sing some psalms out to him. And I start to feel those psalms. And they, they feel really good. And I start to sing some more. I start to sing really loud, but no one's home, so I don't care. And I'm singing, and I start writing a song to the Casio keyboard. And the presence of God fills this room as I'm, like, rocking out 1980s style with this guitar, you know. And I'm there, and I feel the presence of God come in. I'm like, man, I never realized that song was a way to access joy. That song was a way to enter into the presence of God. Sometimes you just need to get over yourself. And you're like, where's the practical application in this point? It's to sing. (laughs) All you can do is preach the Bible sometimes. God says sing over and over again. And you're like, well, that's not very spiritual. It actually is. It's actually really biblical. We access God through salvation and remembering when he delivered us. We access God through praying through others for others and their deliverance. We access the joy. Through singing out loud. And it may sound elementary, but guess what? Come as children to enter my kingdom, Jesus says. We come in and enter like children. The last part we're going to talk about today before Abel shares his story is we find joy in suffering. We find joy in suffering. We're not the ones that write the Bible. But God knows what we will face And the other dominant theme that we find joy associated with is seasons of difficulty, seasons of lack, seasons of suffering. We find this throughout the Old Testament. It talks about in the prophets, the meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord, and the neediest people shall exult in the Holy One. We talk about meekness in the New Testament. We think of this power under control. We think of humility. But the Old Testament was different where, thank you, The Old Testament was different. In the Old Testament, those that needed humility or to be humbled were those in positions of privilege. Meekness were those that were oppressed and had a choice to give up or revolt against their oppressors. So in this context, meekness becomes this choice. But meekness, Isaiah writes, has access to fresh joy has access to something that's new to them and only to them. David would write in the Psalms, verse, chapter 30, verse 5, weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes in the morning. There's a son of God that can open and shine light in the midst of your difficulty. Psalm 126, we referenced this earlier. Verse 5 and 6 says this, May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. Those who go out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy carrying their sheaves. When they return from the captivity of Babylon, they come back to a desolate land with no harvest. So what do they do? As they're planting seeds, they begin to weep. And their tears are going into the ground along with their seeds. This then becomes a tradition in Israel because that harvest year, they said there were shouts of joy throughout the land. 
So every year when they would plant seeds, they would sow them with tears saying, God, we trust you for harvest. God, we know the land is difficult. We know the harvest is difficult, but we trust you. And when harvest would come, they would celebrate what God did. It goes on. In Habakkuk, it talks about the fig tree does not blossom and no fruit is on the vines. Though the produce of the olives fail and the fields yield no food. Though the flock is cut off from the fold and there is no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. That word means to read joy, to instill joy into your life. God is with you in your season of suffering. We go to the New Testament, we think God's going to let us off the hook. And you read passages like James 1. Verse 2 and 3, to what? Consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. The testing of your faith produces perseverance. This is James, the brother of Jesus. He says that most difficult season, that word test, is not just, oh, man, I hope I really passed the test today. It's severe trial. It's severe difficulty. There's access for joy in that season. Peter goes on to say that there's access for joy in the midst of the sufferings of Christ. Paul goes on in 1 Thessalonians, be imitators of us in suffering and experience the joy of the Holy Spirit. This is a theme. Well, maybe Jesus will let us off the hook. Final verses here, Luke 6. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day. Leap for joy. For surely your reward is great in heaven, for that of their ancestors did the prophets. So here's Jesus saying, when you're persecuted, when you're assaulted against, there's joy available to you. And Jesus is the one. How do we practically find joy in suffering? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. You're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. The moment you're in that place of suffering or difficulty, that season that is never ending, God's not outside of it. He's right next beside you in that season. He's by your side. It is an access for joy. How do we find joy in suffering? We look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. In those moments of difficulty, we say, Jesus, you endured the cross for me. Help me find joy in my moment of suffering now. Help me find joy, that internal drive and, and joy, that rejoicing, that exaltation that you have for me. Help me access it. Jesus, I call upon you. How do we practically find joy? We find it in salvation. We find it in song. And we find it by fixing our eyes on Jesus in our seasons of suffering. Just as we close this morning, my friend Abel is going to share his story on how God restored his relationship with his father and how he brought a season of restoration. Would you welcome Abel as he shares? You guys are too kind. Thank you. So this is the overachieving 9 o'clock service that the pastors always brag about to all the other services. All right. All right. I see you guys. Um, so I got to tell you guys, you, you know, growing up and really even into my adulthood, um, the fruit of joy or joy period and fathering was not anything that was ever modeled to me. It was a completely foreign concept. Um, you know, childhood, adulthood. Um, let me just put it this way to give you guys a glimpse into my life. Um, I see Pastor Francis's book on father wounds, and I raise him a father-in-law wounds book. All right, and then um, if we could get a two-book deal, I'll even throw in spiritual father wounds book. Okay, because I've had plenty of those. Um, so a little bit about me: I, I grew up in a pretty small family. It was just me, my mom and dad, and my six older siblings. Um, <laughs> Contrary to popular belief, I wasn't spoiled, and I, but don't worry, I, get him, I always get him back because I always tell him that God saved best for last. Yeah. All right. Um, so it is, you know, just a snapshot of what my dad was like and my relationship with my dad. It's basically two things that I can say. Um, he was very religious and super strict. And being the youngest of seven, you can imagine he was working tons and tons of hours to feed a, a pretty big family. Uh, and when he was home, it was his way or the highway, right? It was never like, yay, dad's home. It was, oh, God, dad's home. Okay, i got to get my stuff together. And, you know, growing up, that really left me uh, feeling neglected and feeling rejected. Um, and a lot of times that, that actually, you know, boiled over into my adulthood. Um, you know, with, when I was a kid, when I was probably 12, 13 years old, 14 years old, uh, I actually took some scissors. I went to my photo album. And I cut my dad's picture out of every single picture that I could find in my photo album. Uh, I just didn't want anything to do with him. I didn't want, you know, 
I didn't want him. I didn't want to be his kid. I, you know, it, it was pretty tough. And uh, as I got older, that that boiled over, and and I would have, you know, I'd <laughs> jump down my dad's throat every time we had any kind of conversations about God. And anytime he brought anything about up about God, I'd be like, No, Dad, that's not how it works. And I'd just jump down his throat, and uh, I'd do it in front of my kids. I didn't care who was who was around, who was watching, who wasn't watching. Um, I'd just jump down his throat, and. And, uh, and God forbid my wife ever came to me and said, honey, you know, it's, it's been six months or a couple years since we've seen your parents. Maybe we should go visit them. And uh, as Pastor Brandon was talking about um, throwing adult tantrums, I, I'd throw a bunch of adult tantrums. And my wife would be like, okay, well, when you're done with all of that, we're going to be in the car waiting for you. <laughs> Come on down. Let's get in the car. We'll go see your parents and everything will be all right. And that, that, really, didn't, um, that really didn't help because then after – I'd go, and my dad would say something. I'd flip out, and we'd have an argument. And then on the way home, I'd tell my wife, you see that? That was your fault. If you didn't make me go see my parents, none of that would have happened. Uh, and then one day, uh, you know, i, I got to tell you guys, you know, my, um, I hear God pretty often, and most of the time he sounds like my wife. Um, <laughs> and one day my wife pulls me aside, and she says, hey, um, Honey, I, I, know, I know you love your kids, and I know you're such a great guy. And, and that's kind of dangerous when your wife pulls you aside and says, Honey, I know you're a great guy, and I love you. That's, you're, you know, you, you, it, you're in it. Um, she said, But, you know, you, your, your kids are watching your life. And they, see what you, they hear what you're saying, but they also see how you're treating your parents. And that weighs way more than anything else. And they're going to weigh the fruit of your, your life way more than the fruit of your lips. And I said, Okay. Okay, God, you got my attention. And one of the reasons why that really got my attention was because I realized that I was being a hypocrite. And God started showing me that I was being a hypocrite because I was demanding something of my dad's life that I wasn't willing to produce in my own life. Right? Mm. And so I said, okay, God, how do we do this? And, and uh, I'll never forget, I went to God because I wanted him to help me resolve my dad issues. And he says, okay, I want you to learn to be a good son. And I said, Porque? Like, no, 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 God, you don't understand. It's not about me. It's about my dad. Like, help me help him, not help me help me. And so uh, he, he took me graciously to the Old Testament, to the commandments, and he showed me how it says, honor your father and your mother, period. He said, you realize that there's no little asterisk, and then underneath it says, honor your father and mother, unless, uh, in, in the words of Pastor Francis, they sucketh then you're off the hook. You're, you're all right. You don't have to worry about honoring them. You're just, you're all right. Just, just do your thing. Now, I will say that honoring your parents doesn't mean that you don't have boundaries. There's a big difference between honoring your parents and just, just being beat up for the rest of your life, right? And so I said, okay, God, let's, let's, let's do it. Let's, what does this look like? And so um, I, I'd go to my parents' house, and my dad would go off on one of his religious, you know, rants, and God would say, I'm not interested in controlling what he's doing. I'm interested in controlling what you're doing. You got your response. Work on your response. And so in the beginning, it was really tough. I'd bite my tongue, and I'm like, oh, God, Dad, whatever. Okay, you know what? Let's just, just can we not talk about that? Um, and then as God started dealing with my heart and as, as I started loving my dad and, and as God started dealing with me and who I was as being a son, that completely started changing. And all of a sudden, my dad would go off on one of his rants and about how we're not saved because we're not having 100 kids. And um, instead of jumping down his throat, I'd say, okay, Dad, listen, Dad, I, I love you. And I, I just, I'm just here to, to be your son. And I, I'm just here to have a relationship with you as my dad. I'm not here to have church service. You did a great job the 18 years that I was at home. Let's just stop that. And long and behold, he, he did. Um, and you know what's crazy is that for the longest time, I had this burning question that would run through my head. Um, see, before my dad came to Christianity, he was an actor. He traveled all over. He put on these little shows and stuff. And I always wondered, I always thought inside of me, like, God, what would my dad look like if we could peel back the, the decades of religion off of his personality? You know, if he didn't lose his personality in, pr in pursuit of who you are. And, and as I started um, dealing with who I was, I, I started seeing my dad's even countenance changing and who he was started changing. You know, my dad never allowed us to participate in sports because as, as far as he was concerned, he's like, look, if, if God wanted you guys to do sports, it would have been recorded in the scriptures that Jesus was on a soccer team. <laughs> That's not in there, and so you guys aren't doing sports, and so it's either, you know, church or you're at home. Um, 
and you know, what was, was awesome is that as he began to change and as he began to, he pulled me aside one day and he's like, hey, you know, are your kids in any sports? And I'm thinking there's some condemnation that's coming, right? And he's like, uh, no, 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 you know, I, I want them to be active and stuff. Is there anything that I can help with? I'm like, where's my dad and what did you do with him? Like, what's, <laughs> what's going on here? Um, and then he started, right, like, dancing wasn't allowed. And, you know, all of a sudden, my, I'd see my dad, like, shrugging his shoulders and stuff. Like, he's, you know, he's dancing and stuff. And I'm like, okay, this is crazy. And my relationship with him started changing in all kinds of different dynamics. And one day, God revealed to me, and what he, what he showed me was that my relationship with my dad was beginning to change. And the question that I always had of, I wonder what my dad would look like without all the religion, was actually being answered. And God was like, I'm rewarding you for getting on the operating table. I'm letting you see something that, and honestly, I thought that was something that I wouldn't see until heaven. I was like, okay, maybe, you know, if I get to heaven and hopefully my dad's there, you know, I'll actually see him for who he really was. And God was like, no, I'm letting you see what that's like here on earth. Just because you simply made the, the hard uh, decision to get on the operating table. And in my opinion, God redeemed my relationship with my dad simply because I got to a point where I valued the liberty of Christ over the heaviness of bitterness and unforgiveness. Yeah. Right, so I don't want to. I don't want to hang on to that. Yeah. Now, the greatest, the, the biggest revelation through this whole thing that I realized was that I can't produce the fruit of bitterness and the fruit of the spirit at the same time. Yeah. The, the word says in um, in Hebrews uh, twelve, it says, "Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grow up to trouble you, or corrupting many, or defiling many." That word uh, root actually is is like the sprouting up of something uh, or the growth of something. So it's basically fruit, right? And I realized that I couldn't hang on to the bitterness of who my dad was and, and keep producing the, the fruit, fruit of bitterness while I was waiting and trying to and hoping that I would produce the, the fruit of um, joy and goodness in my own life with my own kids. And that actually not only redeemed my relationship with my dad, all of a sudden my uh, interaction with my kids changed. Because one thing that I realized throughout the whole process was that I don't know a whole lot, and I don't need to pretend to know a whole lot. And people will always come up to me, and they're like, uh, you have such great kids. And I'm like, I know. And they're like, no, they're so awesome. They love God, and they're God-fearing, and they pray for people. And I'm like, I know. And they'll always usually follow that up with, like, what do you do? What's, what's the secret, right? What's the secret sauce? And I tell them, um, there's a lot to be said about knowing nothing about parenting and completely relying on the Holy Spirit. And since I no longer have to have this facade of like, oh, I know, I know what I'm doing and I have to keep, my, you know, my, keep it together, there's two things that I often tell my kids. One is, I don't know, did you ask the Holy Spirit? And the other one is I get to say sorry to them. Now, you have to understand that the culture that I grew up in, a father saying sorry to a kid was like a no-no. I mean, that was like death, right? Like they, I would, people would self-combust and like die and, you know, blow up into pieces. Um, and, I, and I get to say it all the time because I... I, I I don't care enough about what's going on with me. And the truth of it is, is I want to be as vulnerable as I can with my kids. And I always say, you know, the, the, the freedom that, you know, transparency that I've experienced is like a, by, is a byproduct of the fruits of the spirit. You know, if the fruits of the spirit were apples, uh, transparency would be an apple pie, right? I love apple pies. Mm. Um, so not having, you know, not having to keep a facade on and being open has, has been super amazingly liberating for me and my kids. Um, the reason why is because I want my kids to know what their dad is like with Christ and outside of Christ. I mean, um, I want them to see me, you know, I, I want them to see me struggling with life and sin when I go lonely, Lone Ranger, and I want them to see the victory I gain in my life when I abide in Christ. And I honestly believe that the more they see me do the two, the more they see how wrecked I am outside of Christ and how, you know, how well things internally are when I'm with Christ, the more they're going to be, um, you know, drawn to a life that's surrendered to Christ, right? And they get to see my life like full access. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've had my kids pray over me and anoint, anoint, you know, anoint me with oil and, uh, and, and praying over me and seeing, you know, I, I even go to them with questions and I'm like, all right, we, we got to pray and we got to ask God about this because dad doesn't know what, you know, what's happening with this and what's going on with this. And I, I can tell you guys that, that, that the journey of my relationship with God, um, increasing my relationship with my dad, 
uh, being redeemed in my relationship, even with my kids benefiting, um, you know, all, all really started with me going to God and saying, okay, Lord, you're the, the master vine dresser, and I'm tired of consuming the poisonous fruit that my life is producing. Because the truth is we're going we're gonna to consume whatever fruit our hearts are, are producing, whether it's fruits of bitterness or the fruits of the spirit, right? Um, can I get an amen? Amen. amen. Now, I'll tell you guys this. This is the awesome thing about the word amen. It actually means let it be so, which means God, do it again. And I can tell you guys that God is not a cruel God, that he would do something for one person and wouldn't allow it to be available for somebody else. And um, I just, uh, you know, as, as we progress, especially with Father's Day, I just want to say that, you know, this is a small snippet of what God's done and the redemptive work that he's done with me and my dad. And I'm fully convinced, fully, fully persuaded that it's also available to every single person that's in here that's willing to get on that operating table and say, okay, God, let's do this. Thank you, guys.